Just by way of explanation, the last few, few presentations, you've probably noticed that my speech has been different. Unfortunately, due to some medication that I have to take, it affects my speech and makes certain consonants and words hard to pronounce. I apologize for that, and I hope that it doesn't distract from your learning and that you'll be patient with my explanations. And that's why in these last few weeks, three or four weeks, my pronunciation, voice, and, and just speaking has been different. This week, we are going to take a look at the books of First and Second Thessalonians and what Christ teaches through his Apostle Paul in these books. So let's first do First Thessalonians chapter 1 through chapter 5. First Thessalonians Introduction First Thessalonians is believed to be the earliest writings of Paul existing epistles. In fact, it is probably the oldest book in the New Testament, having been written more than a decade before any of the Gospels. Paul's teachings in the first epistles to the Thessalonians are primarily focused on the second coming of Jesus Christ, including the hardships that followers of Jesus Christ will face during Christ's return. The resurrection of Christians at the second coming and the timing of Christ's coming. Paul mentioned the second coming in every chapter of First Thessalonians. These teachings are especially valuable to Latter-day Saints who live in the dispensation in which the Lord has said, The time of my coming is nigh at hand. That's Dr. Covenants 35.15. During his second missionary journey, Paul had labored with Silas and Timothy in Thessalonica. The three men were forced out of the city by Jewish leaders. Paul later sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to give support and encouragement to church members there. Later, Timothy reported to Paul at Corinth that the Thessalonian saints had remained faithful despite persecution and that their righteous influence was spreading. It is likely that Paul wrote his first epistle to the Thessalonians shortly after he received this news in about A.D. 52. The short explanatory end note known as subscription that is found at the conclusion of 1 Thessalonians in some versions of the Bible incorrectly states that the epistle was written from Athens. In reality, evidence suggests that 1 Thessalonians was written from Corinth, since both Silas and Timothy contributed to the writings of these epistles. This letter could only have been written, have been written after Silas and Timothy had joined Paul in Corinth. The Thessalonian converts were some of the first Europeans to embrace the gospel, and they faced persecution as a result. They also had many questions about the second coming, perhaps because they were looking forward to a better time with less persecution. Therefore, in this letter to the Thessalonians, Paul wrote words of encouragement and strength, and he addressed their questions about the second coming of Jesus Christ. One of Paul's main themes in his first epistles to Thessalonians is the second coming. He focused not on the destruction of the wicked, but on the participation of the righteous at Jesus Christ's coming, especially those saints who had previously, who had died previously. Paul illustrated the nature of the Godhead in various passages that refer to God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost which shows that Paul had a clear understanding that they were three separate beings. Also, unlike many of Paul's other epistles, 1 Thessalonians does not contain any major rebukes or corrections, but instead offers praise and commenda commendation for the Thessalonian saints. Let's now go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. The gospel comes both in word and in power. 1 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1. Silvanus is a longer form of the name Silas, 
who was Paul's second missionary companion. Frequently, Paul introduced his letters by mentioning God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. There is no doubt that the Apostle knew and taught that they were two separate members of the Godhead. 1 Thessalonians 1, four: Your Election of God This doctrine of the election of the grace is as follows. As part of the new song the saints will sing when they see eye to eye and the millennial era has been millennial era has been ushered in will be these words quote, I the Lord hath redeemed his people Israel according to the election of grace which was brought to pass by the faith and the covenant of their fathers unquote. Doctrine and Covenants eighty four ninety eight through one oh two. This election of grace is a very fundamental, logical, and important part of God's dealings with men through the ages. To bring to pass the salvation of the greatest possible number of his spirit children, the Lord, in general, sends the most righteous and worthy saints to earth through the lineage of Abraham and Jacob. This course is a manifestation of his grace, or in other words, his love, mercy, and condescension towards his children. This election as chosen lineage is based on pre-existent worthiness and is thus made according to the foreknowledge of God. See 1 Peter 1, 2. Those so grouped together during their mortal probation have more abundant opportunities to make and keep the covenants of salvation, a right which they earned by pre-existent devotion to the cause of righteousness. As part of this election, Abraham and others of the noble and great spirits were chosen before they were born for the particular missions assigned to them in this life. And that's in Abraham 3.22-24 through 24 and Romans chapter 9. 1 Thessalonians 1.4, your election of God continued. As with every basic doctrine of the gospel, the Lord's system of election based on pre-existent faithfulness has been changed and perverted by an apostate Christendom. So abused have been the fact false conclusions reached in this field that millions of severe, sincere, though deceived persons have devoutly believed that in accordance with the divine will, men were predestined to receive salvation or damnation, which no act on their part could change. Actually, as the full blessings of salvation are followed, the doctrine of election must operate twice. First, righteous spirits are elected or chosen to come to mortality as heirs of special blessings. Then, they must be called and elected again in this life, an occurrence which takes place when they join the true church, D.C. 53.1. Finally, in order to reap eternal salvation, they must press forward in obedience in obedient devotion to truth until they make their calling and election sure, Second Peter 1, that is, are sealed up into eternal life, Doctrine and Covenants 131, 5. Joseph Smith taught, God did elect or predestinate, meaning foreordained, that all those who would be saved should be saved in Christ Jesus and through obedience to the gospel, but he passes over no man's sins, but visits them with correction. And if his children will not repent of their sins, he will discard them. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.5, the gospel is taught in word and in power. After he greeted the Thessalonian saints, Paul reminded them that during his mission among them, he had preached the gospel, not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 Concerning the significance of the gospel being taught in both word and power, Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, quote, the true gospel consists of two things, the word and the power. Anyone can have the word. The books in which it is written are universally available. 
but the power must come from God. It is and must be dispensed according to his mind and his will to those who abide the law, entitling them to receive it. The word of the gospel is the spoken or written account of what men must do to be saved. But actual salvation comes only when the power of God is received and used. And this power is the power of the priesthood and the power of the Holy Ghost. There must operate in the lives of men, otherwise their souls cannot be cleansed. They cannot be born again. They cannot become new creatures of the Holy Ghost. They cannot put off the natural man and become saints. They cannot be sanctified by the Spirit. Anyone can claim to have the gospel and can in fact have it in the intellectual sense of knowing what the doctrines of salvation are. But only those who receive the power of God in their lives have the fullness of the gospel. They only are candidates for salvation. To identify this power, God has ordained that certain signs and gifts shall follow those that believe. By faith, they cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead, work miracles, gain testimonies, receive revelations, entertain angels, and view the visions of eternity. Where these signs are, there is the power of the gospel, and where the power is, there is the fullness of the everlasting gospel. End of Brother McConkie's quote. First Thessalonians 5, the phrase much assurance, much meaning much testimony, repeated promptings from the Holy Spirit that the gospel is true and consists of such and such things. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6-9, those who are converted share the gospel. The phrase receives the word of the Holy Ghost, meaning no one ever receives the gospel until he gains a revelation from the Holy Ghost. The gospel is a spiritual matter and comes only by the power of the Spirit. The Thessalonian saints had proven themselves faithful in the face of Mark's affliction, verse 6. It must have been comforting for the early saints to know that church leaders were praying for them, just as the brethren pray for the saints today. Paul wrote that the converted Thessalonian saints had become examples to non-believers around them. Chapter 1, verse 7. He commanded them, he commended their efforts to spread the gospel, saying, in 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 every place your faith is spread abroad, so that we need not speak of anything. That's verse 8. The Thessalonian members were such effective missionaries that Paul and his companions did not feel a need to return to preach in this area. Elder Joel P. Willard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles used 1 Thessalonians 1, 5-6 to explain the connection between one's personal conversion and one's desire to share the gospel. Quote, Paul rejoiced in the fact that what he had told the Thessalonians was not meaningless words to them, for they had listened with great interest, and what was taught them produced a powerful desire for righteousness in their lives. Paul was pleased that the gospel message has been received with such joy and happiness despite many hardships. Finally, he noted that what must have been crowning achievement, that they were inspiring examples to all their neighbors, and that from them the word of the Lord had extended to others everywhere, far beyond their boundaries. Paul paid tribute to them when he told them that when it Wherever he traveled, he found people telling him about their remarkable good works and good faith in God. End of quote. First, the first Thessalonians chapter one ten, chapter two nineteen, chapter three thirteen, chapter four sixteen through eighteen, chapter five twenty three, the com- second coming of Jesus Christ. Timothy apparently took word to Paul that the Thessalonian saints had questions about the second coming of Jesus Christ, for Paul mentioned the second coming in each chapter of First Thessalonians. Paul sought to help the saints recognize that the Lord's return would be a time of deliverance, hope, and rejoicing for the righteous saints, both living and dead. The second coming will also be accompanied by the destruction of the wicked, 
the wrath to come, from which the righteous will be delivered. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 Joseph Smith Matthew 1.4 indicates that when the Savior comes again, it will be the end of the world or the destruction of the wicked. The gospel is to prepare the saints for the hour of judgment which is to come, that their souls may escape the wrath of God, the dis- the desolation of abomination which awaits the wicked, both in this world and in the world to come. The NC 88, 84 through 85. Just a word about this phrase, escape the wrath of God. God's wrath is not that he's this angry God and yelling and screaming and mad and, you know, like we think of wrath. The wrath of God just means God's justice. His justice will cause the wicked to be punished according to their works. So the wrath of God just means God's righteous use of justice. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, true ministers preach in a godly manner. 1 Thessalonians 2, preach the gospel with sincere love. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12, Paul spoke about his early ministry in Thessalonica. Thessalonica. Paul's language in these verses might suggest that detractors in Thessalonica were questioning Paul's sincerity and motivations during his ministry in the city. Paul defended himself by describing the sincere and earnest manner in which he and his companions had taught and served the saints. Paul's words are reminiscent of those found in Doctrine and Covenants 12.8, which says, No one can assist in this work except he shall be humble and full of love, having faith, hope, and charity. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency related a personal experience that helped him learn the importance of love as we serve and minister one another. Quote, The most effective missionaries, members, and full-time always act out of love. I learned this lesson as a young man. I was assigned to visit a less active member, a successful professional many years older than I. Looking back on my actions, I realized I had very little love concerning for the man I visited. I acted out of duty with the desire to report 100% on my home teaching. One evening, close to the end of a month, I phoned to ask if my companion and I could come over and visit him. His chastening reply taught me an unforgettable lesson. No, I don't believe I want you to come over this evening, he said. I am tired. I've already dressed for bed. I am ready, and I am just not willing to be interrupted so that you can report 100% on your home teaching this month. That reply still stings me because I knew he had sensed my selfish motivation. I hope no person we approach with an invitation to hear the message of the restored gospel feels that we are acting out of any reason other than a genuine love for them and an unselfish desire to share something we know to be precious. End of quote. 1 Thessalonians 2.2, Speaking with Much Contention Paul wrote that he and his missionary companions had preached the gospel to the Thessalonians with much contention. Chapter 2, verse 2. This phrase does not mean that Paul was contentious or argumentative in his preaching. Instead, it implies that he taught the gospel in the face of contention and opposition. In Thessalonica, resistance to the gospel message came from both antagonistic Jews and Gentiles. You can see that in Acts 17, 5 through 10. Missionaries today inevitably face similar trials, but those who continue to preach despite opposition find, as Paul did, that the work is not in vain. Chapter 2, verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 16. In spite of strong strong opposition, first at Philippi and then at Thessalonica, without guile and deceit, verse 3, being trusted with the gospel, Paul taught those that that please God, not of pleasing men. That's verse 4. 
Their preaching was not to impress others with flattering words or to co cover it accept acceptance of others or for the glory of the world. That's verses 5 through 6. Paul had such love for the saints at Thessalonica that he was willing to not just impart the gospel to them, but to give his whole soul to their welfare, verses 7 and 8. Paul and his companions boldly proclaimed the gospel without desire for personal or financial gain, verse 9. In fact, the Greeks disdained annual, annual, annual labor and viewed it as the activity of slaves. I'm sorry, that should be the same manual labor. I'm sorry that I didn't catch that. Paul was not embarrassed to do physical work and did not want the saints to have to support him. And the saints were witnesses of how holy, justly, and unblameable, unblameably Paul had been. Verse 10. But he was like a babe or like a mother who nurses her own children or a father who guides and directs his son to help them walk worthy of God. Verses 11 through 12. Paul was grateful that the saints at Thessalonica had received the word of God not as being preached by man, but as it is in truth the word of God. Verse 13. Today the saints are counseled by the Savior to do the same. Doctrine and Covenants, section 50, verses 12 through 22, talk about how the gospel should be preached. It says, Wherefore, I, the Lord, ask you this question, unto what were you ordained? To preach my gospel by the Spirit, even the Comforter, which was sent forth to teach the truth. And then receive ye spirits which ye could not understand, and receive them to be of God, and in this are you justified? Behold, ye shall answer this question yourselves. Nevertheless, I will be merciful unto you. He that is weak among you hereafter shall be made strong. Verily I say unto you, he that is ordained of me and sent forth to preach the word of truth by the Comforter in the Spirit of truth, doth he preach it by the Spirit of truth or some other way? Well, what's another way you could preach the gospel other than in the direction of the Spirit? Well, that would be by the intellect, just because of your intellect you teach it. And if it be by some other way, it is not of God. And again, he that receiveth the word of truth, so all of the responsibility on learning is not just a teacher, but he that receiveth the word of truth, doth he receive it by the Spirit of truth or some other way. Are you listening in our classes and in sacrament meetings by the Spirit or some other way? What could be some other way? Well, letting your mind wander, worrying about other things, not focusing on what being has said, texting and looking at Facebook and on your iPhone during sacrament meeting, during the sacrament and during classes. That would be some other way. If it be some other way, it is not of God. Therefore, why is it that you cannot understand and know that he that receiveth the word by the Spirit of truth receiveth and it is preached by the Spirit of truth? Wherefore, he that preacheth and he that receiveth understand one another, and both are edified and rejoice together. Verse 14, the Gentile Thessalonian church has suffered much at the hands of their fellow countrymen, just as the Jewish church had suffered from the unbelieving Jews. Here was a bond of union and sympathy between the two. Verses 15 through 16, Paul is saying the Jews had followed St. Paul with unceasing hostility in Europe as well as in Asia. They had driven him from Thessalonica and Beoria, and were doing their utmost against him at Corinth. These are non-member Jews that are doing this. Their narrow exclusiveness, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, and hatred of other nations, contrary to all men, were a bitter trial to a patriot like St. Paul. There was no longer any hope of their repentance or escape from their doom, for the wrath is come upon them to the utmost. The end was close at hand. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 17 through 18. Satan seeks to hinder the work. 
Paul had not been back to Thessalonica after he was driven out during his second missionary journey. He said he had been unable to return because he was hindered by Satan from doing so. That's chapter 2, verse 18. He did not give any details about how Satan hindered him from returning to Thessalonica, but it is clear that persecution from Jews had already forced Paul to take many detours in his journey. You can see that in Acts 17, 13 through 15. Concerning opposition to the Lord's servants, President Howard W. Hunter noted, quote, Satan is always present and will do everything he can do to hinder and block and defeat, end of quote. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. In the phrase, in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming, is reminiscent of Doctrine and Covenants 88, 97, which says, caught up to meet him in the midst of the pillar of heaven. Let's now go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Saints exhort to perfect that which is lacking in their faith. 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 3 through 4. Christ ministers are appointed to suffer persecution and affliction. Even the Lord's apostles learn obedience by the things which they suffer. However, just mere suffering does not make us wise. As Anne Morrow Lindbergh stated, quote, I do not believe that sheer suffering teaches. If suffering alone taught, all the world would be wise since everyone suffers. To suffering must be added mourning, understanding, patience, love, openness, and willingness to remain vulnerable. End of quote. 1 Thessalonians 3, 5 through 9. Verse 5, Paul could no longer endure the suspense and sent word to see if the saints in Thessalonica had not been tempted by Satan and had lost their faith. Verses 6 through 7, Paul is explaining when Paul learned that they were firm in the faith, he com in faith it comforted him even helping him endure his own afflictions and distress. Verse 8, Paul is saying, We will live in Christ only if we stand fast in faith of the Lord and endure to the end, such as Mosiah 31, verses 19 through 20 state, quote, And now, my beloved brethren, after you have gotten into the straight and narrow path, I would ask if all is done. Behold, I say unto you, Nay. For you have not come thus far, save it were by the word of Christ, with unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God of all men. Wherefore, if you will press forward, feasting upon the words of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. End of the quote in Mosiah. Verse 9, Paul is saying, instead of taking credit for himself and boasting on the good work done among the Thessalonians, Paul thanked God for the joy he had from what God had done. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, abound in faith. Paul was very pleased with Timothy's report of good tidings of faith and charity among church members in Thessalonica, chapter 3, verse 6. Nevertheless, Paul reminded the saints that discipleship requires consistent growth and improvement. He encouraged them to increase and abound in love one towards another, to abound more and more in their efforts to please God, and to increase more and more in love. That is chapter 3, verse 12. A similar principle was taught by Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles when he stated that, quote, discipleship is to be lived in crescendo, end of quote. President Harry B. Eyring of the First Presidency spoke about the increased need for continuous spiritual growth in the latter days, quote, as the forces around us increase in intensity, whatever spiritual strength was once sufficient will not be enough. 
and whatever growth and spiritual strength we once thought was possible, greater growth will be made available to us. Both the need for spiritual strength and the opportunity to acquire it will increase at rates which we underestimate at our peril. End of quote. 1 Thessalonians 3.13, Unblameable in Holiness. As we strive to live the gospel and love God with all of our heart, might, mind, and strength, God's grace can make us innocent and blameless before the presence of God, thus becoming justified and sanctified. Quoting DNC 4.2, Therefore, O ye that embark in the service of God, see that ye serve him with all of your heart, might, mind, and strength, that you may stand blameless before God at the last day. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Saints Exhorted to Be Holy. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 2. Paul urged the saints to live more and more according to the teaching sanctioned and exemplified by the Lord Jesus Christ. Modern prophets have given similar exhortation. For example, President Howard W. Hunter said, quote, I would invite all members of the church to live with ever more attention to the life and example of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially the love and hope and compassion he displayed. End of quote. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 through 5, the law of chastity. In Paul's day, sexual relations outside of marriage were tolerated and accepted by many Gentiles. Since most of the new members in the church in Thessalonica were Gentile converts who had turned to God from idols, that's verse 9, Paul felt the need to strengthen their understanding of gospel principles in regarding chastity. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 5, Paul helped these members understand that as members of Christ's church, they should abstain from fornication, pose, poses their vessel, meaning control their body, and choose not to give into lust of concupiscence. I'm not sure how to pronounce that right, which means lustful passions. Concerning the Lord's standard of sexual purity, Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles stated, quote, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has a single, undeviating standard of sexual morality. Intimate relations are proper only between a man and woman in the marriage relationship prescribed in God's plan. Such revelation." Relations are not merely a curiosity to be exploited, an appetite to be satisfied, or a type of recreation or entertainment to be pursued selfishly. They are not a conquest to be achieved or simply an act to be performed. Rather, they are immortality, one of the ultimate expressions of our divine nature and potential and a way of strengthening emotional and spiritual bonds between husband and wife. We are agents blessed with mortal agency are defined and are defined by our divine heritage as God's children and not by sexual behaviors, contemporary attitudes, or secular philosophies. Our identity is the divine heritage. Uh, that was the end of quote. Our divine heritage as children of God is our identity. We are not identified by gender, by sexuality, by race, or by anything else. That would be what Satan would want. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, Sanctification. Sanctification means holiness, which means being separated or set apart for a specific purpose. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, To be sanctified is to become clean, pure, and spotless, to be free from the blood and sins of the world, to become a new creature of the Holy Ghost, one whose body has been renewed by the rebirth of the Spirit. Sanctification is a state of saintliness, a state attained only by conformity to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. The plan of salvation is the system and means provided whereby men may sanctify their souls and thereby become worthy of a celestial inheritance. End of quote. Thus, 
when we become sanctified, we are separated from the world and sped apart for the specific purpose of gaining exaltation and becoming joint heirs with Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 5, concupiscence. There's that word again. It, this word is Latin word meaning to desire passionately. Therefore, the verse could read, not in the lust of lustfulness. Verse Thessalonians 4, 7 through 8, saints called unto holiness. Paul told the Thessalonian saints, God has not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. Verse 7, since the time of the Old Testament, God's people have been commanded to separate themselves from unholy and unclean things. See Leviticus 20, 24-26. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency explained that personal holiness comes through a com combination of our efforts and God's work of purifying our, heart, our hearts. Quote, holiness comes by faith and through obedience to God's laws and ordinances. God then purifies the heart by faith, and the heart becomes purged from that which was profane and unworthy. End of quote. First Thessalonians chapter four verses seven through eight. Saints called unto holiness continued. Verse eight, the phrase despiseth not man but God, meaning having just won the saints of sexual lustfulness, Paul states that if you participate in such actions, then you are not despising man but God who has given us the Holy Ghost to know good from evil. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 12, increasing in holiness. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 10, Paul counseled the saints to increase more and more in their love towards one another. He encouraged them to endeavor to lead a quiet life, to not meddle in the affairs of others. Study to be quiet and to do your own business. That's verse 11. To work out with their own hands and avoid dependency on others and to be honest. That's verses 11 through 12. Concerning the idea of living a quiet life, Elder Bruce D. Porter of the Seventy taught, personal prayer, studying, and pondering are vital to the building up of the kingdom within our own souls. It is in quiet moments of contemplation and communion with the Almighty that we come to know and love Him as our Father. End of quote. First Thessalonians 4:14 4, through 17, the coming of Jesus Christ. The Thessalonians Christians were apparently concerned about the fate of deceased church members. They wondered when the righteous dead would be resurrected and whether they would have part in the second coming. Paul told the saints to sorrow not, for the dead, as do others, have no hope. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 He assured the Thessalonians that the righteous saints which sleep in Jesus, chapter 4, verse 14, will take part in the second coming along with the living. 1 Thessalonians 4.16-17 These will God bring with him at his coming. Chapter 4, verse 14 the phrase, not prevent them which sleep, verse 15, means precisely that the living will not have precedence over the dead. Paul further teaches that at the public, the public, publicit, pu, at the publicity, rec, at the publicly recognized second coming, those covenant disciples who have been dead will be resurrected first as Christ descends out of heaven. Then those who are alive on the earth at that moment will be caught up together with the resurrected persons to meet the Lord in the clouds. Elsewhere in his epistle to the Thessalonians, Paul used the Greek word parousia to refer to the second coming. Parousia could refer to the arrival of any person, but it was often used to describe the arrival of a ruler or emperor. In the Greco-Roman world, the arrival or visit of the emperor to a community was anticipated with extensive preparation. 
Paul's use of this word helps him stress the importance of proper preparation for Jesus Christ's return to earth. Paul's portrayal of the second coming of Jesus Christ is confirmed in modern revelation. See DNC 88, 96 through 98. President Dallin H. Oak summed up latter day teachings about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Quote, Four matters are indisputable to Latter-day Saints. One, the Savior will return to the earth in power and great glory to reign personally during a millennium of righteousness and peace. Two, at the time of his coming, there will be a destruction of the wicked and a resurrection of the righteous. Three, no one knows the time of his coming, but four, the faithful are taught to study the signs of it and to prepare for it. End of quote. Now let's go to First Thessalonians chapter five. Saints shall know the season of the second coming of Christ. First Thessalonians five one through eight. Jesus Christ will not come to the saints as a thief. Do we know when Christ shall come to take vengeance on the ungodly and to reign on earth in love and peace for the space of a thousand years? It is generally assumed we do not have any such information as this, that such has not and will not be revealed. The fact is, we do know, that is, we know in general when his coming shall be. We do not know the day nor the hour, and for that matter, neither do the angels of God in heaven. But we do know the time and season that is, we know the approximate time, shall we say, the generation of his return. Paul's illustration here is perfect. The second coming is compared to a woman about to give birth. See chapter 5, verse 3. She does not know the hour or the minute of the child's arrival, but she does know the approximate time. There are signs which precede and presage the promise arrival. And so it is with our Lord's coming. He shall come as a thief in the night, unexpected, unexpectedly and without warning to the world, to those who are in spiritual darkness, to those who are not enlightened by the power of the Spirit. But his coming shall not overtake the saints as a thief, for they know and understand the signs of the times. Paul compared the disciples of Jesus Christ to a sober person who is awake and alert. Chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. These disciples are unimpaired by the drunkenness of worldly living that prevents the wicked from recognizing the nearness of the Lord's coming. They have on the breastplate of faith and love and a helmet the hope of salvation. The breastplate protects the heart. Thus, only with faith in Christ and having charity will our hearts not grow faint, but will endure the trials awaiting the second coming. The helmet protects the head, our thoughts. Therefore, what we think about or think upon or about will be a determining factor in our readiness for Christ's coming. In modern scripture, the Lord has taught, quote, Again, verily I say unto you, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and it overtaketh the world as a thief in the night. Therefore, gird up your loins, that you may be children of light, and that day shall not overtake you as a thief. As Doctrine and Covenants 106, 4 through 5. Concerning the timing of the second coming, President Joseph Fielding Smith stated, I do not know when he is going to come. No man knows. Even the angels of heaven are in the dark in regarding to this great truth. But this I know, that the signs that have been pointed out are here. The earth is full of calamity, of trouble. The hearts of men are failing them. We see the signs as we see the fig tree putting forth her leaves. And knowing this time is near, it behooves me and it behooves you and all men upon the face of the earth to pay heed to the words of Christ, to his apostles, and watch. For we know not the day nor the hour. But I tell you this, it shall come as a thief in the night when many of us will not be ready for it. End of quote. Here are some of the more notable signs. One, 
There is to be an era of total apostasy from the truth. Universal spiritual darkness is to blanket the earth. We know that that has taken place. Two, then there is to be an age of restoration, a period in which God shall restore again all the saving truths ever revealed in any day or time. We know that that has taken place and is continuing to take place. Three, in this period of restoration, the fullness of the everlasting gospel is to be given again to men on earth. Again, that is happening and will continue to happen. Four, this restored gospel shall then be preached in all the world, in all nations, among every kindred of people before our Lord's return. That one has not completely happened yet. Five, the promised restitution of all things is to include the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and its promulgation among all peoples, which we are doing. Six, the church and kingdom of God is to be set up again on the earth in all its glory, beauty, and perfection. We are doing that, and as President Nelson has said, we are continuing the restoration. Seven, many of the scattered remnants of ancient Israel are to be gathered into the fold of Christ, come to the knowledge of their true Messiah, and be assembled again to the lands of their inheritance. That is slowly taking place. We are slowly gathering in ancient Israel into the gospel, through preaching the gospel and through baptism. Eight, that age known as the time of the Gentiles, meaning when the gospel is preferably taken to the Gentiles, is to end. That is, the period of earth's history in which the gospel goes to the Gentiles on a preferential basis shall end. That has not happened. We are still in the times of the Gentiles. 9. Elijah is to come again, restoring the keys of the sealing power. That has happened. I believe that's section 110 of the Doctrine and Covenants. 10. There is to be a messenger before the face of the Lord, preparing the way before him. 11. The Lord is to make various preliminary appearance, appearances in his temples. He has done so and will continue to do so. 12. Desolation, evil, abominations, wars, and signs, both in heaven and on earth, shall be shown forth, including the sending again upon Jerusalem of the abomination of the less desolation. So when all nations will turn against Jerusalem, try to completely destroy it, which is slowly starting to take place. 13. Many of the Jews shall again be assembled in Jerusalem, their city of old. That is slowly taking place. 14. The Lord will come to Adam on Diamond to receive a report from all those who have held the keys of his kingdom on earth and to take back from the Ancient of Days, that's Adam, the keys and powers needed to reign personally on earth during the Millennial Era. 15. Then shall come the great and dreadful day, the day of vengeance and burning, the day when all nations shall be gathered at Armageddon, the day of battle of the great day of God Almighty, the day when the vineyard shall be burned and every corruptible thing consumed, the day when peace and prosperity shall prevail for a thousand years. When shall this promised generation be? It is clear that nearly all of the foregoing has already transpired, and our revelation says that, quote, the great and dreadful day of the Lord is near, n is near even at the doors. Doctrine and Covenants 110.16 True it is that the day and hour of our Lord's coming are and will remain unknown, such being an incentive to all to watch and be ready at all times. Be it true also is that those who watch for the great and dreadful day are expected to read the signs of the times so as to know the approximate time of his coming. President Wilford Woodruff taught that we do know the generation when he will come. 1 Thessalonians 5.12-13, Esteem for Church Leaders In 1 Thessalonians 5.12-13, Paul encouraged the saints to know and esteem those who were over them in the Lord. Although in these verses Paul did not mention specific offices, as he did in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, these teachings suggest that even at this early date, around A.D. 52, 
there were there was some sort of a structure of church leadership. Some modern scholars suggest that the early church did not have any leadership hierarchy and that leadership structures developed much later, perhaps in the second century. It is possible, however, that the early branches of the church had a less formal leadership structure than that the bishops, elders, and deacons described later in Paul's writings. This would parallel the early days of the Restoration when church leadership started with only a first and second elder, with the first presidency, quorum of the twelve apostles, and so on, developing later. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 Quench not the Spirit Towards the end of 1 Thessalonians, Paul gave several items of practical counsel on how to prepare for the Lord's second coming. See 5.6-23 as part of his counsel, Paul asked the saints to quench not the spirit. Chapter 5, verse 19. To quench the spirit means to extinguish or stifle, stifle the influence of the Holy Ghost in one's life. Elder David A. Bednar pointed out that to, enjoy, that to fully enjoy the companionship of the spirit, we must avoid activities that will drive the spirit from us. Quote, if something we think we see or hear or do distances us from the Holy Ghost, then we should stop thinking, seeing, hearing, or doing that thing. If that which is intended to entertain, for example, alienates us from the Holy Spirit, then certainly that type of entertainment is not for us. Because the Spirit cannot abide where that which is vulgar, cute, crude, or immodest then clearly such things are not for us. Because we estrange the Spirit of the Lord when we engage in activities we know we should shun, then such things definitely are not for us. And we become ever more immersed in the Spirit of the Lord. We should strive to recognize impressions when they come and the influences or events that cause us, us to withdraw ourselves from the Holy Ghost. End of quote. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, hold fast to that which is good. Paul invited the Thessalonian saints to test or prove all things, meaning to distinguish between good and evil and to hold fast to that which is good. 5.21, teaching about what it means to hold fast that which is good, Elder Bruce R. McConkie stated, this exhortation was written by the Apostle Paul specifically to members of the church. He was speaking to people who had gained citizenship in the kingdom of God, who had come out of darkness into the marvelous light of Christ, people such as we are supposed to be. He is not speaking to people of the world, but to the saints. It seems evident to me that the Apostle Paul was directing the members of the church to hold fast to the faith. He was saying, cleave unto that which is good, hold fast to the iron rod, be valiant in testimony, work out your own salvation. That is, now that you are members of the church, that you have come in at the gate of repentance and baptism, press forward to the end and do the things that will enable you to be saved in the everlasting kingdom of the Father. End of quote. 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Paul taught the saints to abstain from all appearance of evil, or in other words, from all kinds of evil. See 1 Thessalonians 5.22 footnote B. Church officials have used 1 Thessalonians 5.22 to teach that we should avoid appearing as though we are doing something evil. For example, President James E. Faust taught, I strongly urge you that if there is any question in your mind or hearts about whether your personal conduct is right or wrong, don't do it. It is the responsibility of the prophets of God to teach the word of God, not to spell out every jot and tittle of human conduct. If we are conscientiously trying to avoid not only evil but the very appearance of evil, we will act for ourselves and not be acted upon. End of quote. What a great quote. The, the 
Brethren's job is not to teach us specifically everything we should do personally in our lives. If that was true, then we would have no need for the Holy Ghost. That's why we have the gifts of the Holy Ghost, that we are responsible for every jot and tittle in our life and the appearance we give to the world. Let's now turn to 2 Thessalonians chapters 1 through 3. By way of introduction, in this second epistle to Thessalonians, Paul wrote words of counsel and clarification to members of the church who misunderstood certain aspects of the second coming of Jesus Christ. His teachings helped modern readers understand the nature of the apostasy and, to, and how to prepare appropriately for the Lord's return. The themes of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians are similar, suggesting that Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians to clarify and expand on the first epistle. It is possible that his first letter did not resolve all the questions the Thessalonian saints had about the second coming. In addition, it appears that the Thessalonians had received a fraudulent letter that claimed to be from Paul, and that this letter had caused some to believe that the second coming had already occurred. See Thess 2 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. At the time Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians, he had also learned that Thessalonian church members were experiencing increased persecution. See 2 Thessalonians 1, 4 through 7 Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians in order to strengthen the faith of those members and to correct doctrinal misunderstandings. He also wrote to teach the saints to stop worrying and theorizing about the second coming, especially the precise time of its occurrence. Brothers and sisters, if you watch podcasts, YouTube presentations, or whatever, where someone gives a specific timeline of all the events and when they're going to happen, no, that is not from God. The second epistle to the Thessalonians provides significant details about the second coming of Jesus Christ. They are not found in other biblical prophecies. Some examples include the ideas that the Lord will return in flaming fire, and that the wicked will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. See 2 Thessalonians 1, 8-9. In this epistle... Paul also prophesied of the great apostasy, teaching that the church would undergo a falling away prior to the second coming of the Lord. That's chapter 2, verses 3 through 12. Paul's teachings about the apostasy remind modern church members why the latter-day restoration of the gospel was necessary. Second Thessalonians, now let's go to chapter 1, Ungodly Damned at Second Coming. Second Thessalonians 1, 1 through 4 Greeting and thanksgiving for their constant faith and love and patience under persecution. A part of mortality is to be tried as to our patience and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, the Lord seeth fit to chasten his people. Yea, he trieth their patience and their faith. Nevertheless, whosoever putteth his trust in him, the same shall be lifted up at the last day. That's Mosiah 23, 21-22. 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 6, the phrase, a manifest token. Verse 5, Paul is saying, the words refer to their suffering and their patience. If God is righteous, there must come a time when wrongs such as theirs shall be righted, and patience like theirs be rewarded. Thus, the sufferings and the patience of the Thessalonians became a proof that there is a judgment to come. In verse 66, Paul is saying justice demands both rewards and penalties. Thus, salvation and damnation both come from God. Blessings and cursings both flow from him. If he rewards the righteous, he must punish the wicked. If he blesses those who suffer persecution for righteousness' sake, he must condemn those who act as the per persecutors. 2 Thessalonians 7 1 through 10. Our Lord's second coming will be a day of vengeance, burning, and destruction, a great and dreadful day for the wicked, for those who rebel against his gospel. But for the righteous, it will be a day of redemption, blessing, and salvation, a glorious day of peace and righteousness. At that day, every corruptible thing shall be consumed. Doctrine and Covenants 101 24. 
with those only who are worthy being able to abide the day. And in that day his voice shall be heard. I have trodden the winepress alone, and have brought judgment upon all people, and none were with me. And I have trampled them in my fury, and I will tread upon them in mine anger. Remember, anger just means the righteous use of justice. And their blood have I sprinkled upon my garments, and stained all my remnant. For this was a day of vengeance which was in my heart. And now the year of my redeemed is come, and they shall mention the loving kindness of their Lord, and all that he has bestowed upon them according to his goodness and according to his kindness forever and ever. That was from Doctrine and Covenants 133, 50 through 52. Second Thessalonians 1 7, the phrase rests with us, is better translated relief. The true rest and relief comes to faithful, comes to the faithful when Christ comes. Second Thessalonians one verse eight, the phrase in flame and fire, meaning in that day the elements shall melt with fervent heat. See Doctrine and Covenants section one hundred one twenty five. The phrase taking vengeance, meaning better translated awarding retribution. The phrase, them that know not God and that obey not, better, meaning one, them that know not, and two, them that obey not. Possibly one, meaning the Gentiles, and two, the Jews. Second Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.9, the phrase destruction, Paul's meaning spiritual death, which is to be cast out of the presence of God and to die as pertaining to the things of righteousness. 2 Thessalonians 1.10, the phrase glorified in his saints, Paul is meaning, not simply among them, but in them. His glory is seen in what they are, holy people. 2 Thessalonians 1.11, the phrase this calling, meaning the saints were called to glory and honor, to be glorified in Christ at his coming, to inherit eternal life with them in his kingdom. God initiates every good purpose and every act prompted by faith. Paul prays accordingly that he will bring them to fulfillment. 2 Thessalonians 1.12, the phrase, the name, meaning in ancient times, one name was often more than a personal label. It summed up what a person was. Paul looks for a glory to be ascribed to Christ for all he will do in the lives of the Thessalonian saints. We are to take upon the name of Christ, and that should reflect on what we are. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Apostasy to Precede Second Coming. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 2 and 9 through 15, Be not soon shaken. Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians 2.2 2 suggest that some of the believer in Paul's day were alarmed or fearful that the Lord's second coming had already taken place. Their concerns may have resulted from doctrinal misunderstanding, or they may have been deceived by false teachings in a forged letter purport purportedly written by Paul. See 2 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. Paul cautioned the saints not to embrace information that church leaders had not previously taught. 2 Thessalonians 2.15 President Boyd K. Packer, a quorum of the Twelve Apostles, spoke of the continuing threat of deception in our day. Quote, there are some among us now who have not been regularly ordained by the heads of the church who tell of impending political and economic chaos, the end of the world, they are misleading members. Those deceivers say that the brethren do not know what is going on in the world, or that the brethren approve of their teachings, but do not wish to speak of it over the pulpit. Neither is true. The brethren, by virtue of traveling constantly everywhere on the earth, certainly know what is going on and by virtue of prophetic insight are able to read the signs of the times. Follow your leaders who have been duly ordained and have been publicly sustained, and you will not be led astray. End of quote. 
2 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. The day of Christ is at hand, according to the Lord's timetable. The Joseph Smith translation of 2 Peter 3.8 says, But concerning the coming of the Lord, brethren, I would not have you ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So Christ's timing is different than our timing. So probably according to the way he sees things, the second coming is close at hand, which in our timing may be 50, 70, 100 years from now. Second Thessalonians 2, 3, apostasy preceding the second coming. In order to calm the saints' concern that the Lord had already turned, Paul explained that before the second coming, there would be a falling away first. Second Thessalonians 2, 3. Falling away is a translation of the Greek word apostasia, a word that is closer in meaning to rebellion or mutiny. Paul was therefore speaking of an intentional fight against the gospel of Jesus Christ, then a gradual movement away from it. In the Book of Mormon, Nephi's vision of the future taught him that the house of Israel joined with those in the great and spacious building to fight against the twelve apostles of the Lamb. First Nephi three thirty-five. I'm sorry. First Nephi eleven thirty-five. Apostasy is often not simply a passive letting go of truth, but an active rebellion that originates within the covenant community. President James E. Faust spoke about the apostasy was clearly foretold by the New Testament apostles. Quote, Some of the early apostles knew that an apostasy would occur before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the Thessalonians, Paul wrote concerning this offense. Event, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall, come, shall not come, except there come a falling away first. With this falling away, priesthood keys were lost, and some precious doctrines of the church, organized by the Savior, were changed. Among these were baptism by immersion, receiving the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, the nature of the Godhead, that they are three distinct personages. All mankind will be resurrected through the atonement of Christ, both the just and the unjust. Continuous revelation that the heavens are not closed and temple work for the living and the dead. The period that followed came to be known as the Dark Ages. This falling away was foreseen by the Apostle Peter, who declared that heaven must receive Jesus Christ until the times of restitution or restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, Acts 3, 20-21. Restitution would only be necessary if these precious things had been lost. End of quote. Can you imagine how faithful Paul and Peter and these apostles are doing missionary work, knowing that an apostasy is coming, that sooner or later the church would be taken from the earth. But they still work as hard as they can to bring in as many as they can, even though that it was going to end in an apostasy. That is faithful, brethren. The rapid process of apostasy commenced during the apostles' lifetime. Elder Neil A. Maxwell taught, quote, The New Testament epistle clearly indicates that serious and widespread apostasy, not just sporadic dissent, began soon. James decried wars and fightings among the church, James 4.1. Paul lamented division in the church and how grievous wolves would not spare the fox. Flock, 1 Corinthians 11, 18, Acts 20, 29-31. He knew an apostasy was coming and wrote to the Thessalonians that Jesus' second coming would not occur except there come a falling away first, further advising that iniquity doth already work. Near the end, Paul acknowledged how very extensive the falling away was when he said, all that which are in Asia be turned away from me. That's in 2 Timothy 1.15. Widespread fornication and idolatry brought apostolic alarm. John and Paul both bemoaned the rise of false apostles. 
The church was clearly under siege. Some not only fell away, but then openly opposed. In one circumstance, Paul stood alone and lamented that all men forsook me. He also decried those who subverted whole houses. Some local leaders rebelled, as when one who loved his preeminence received, refused to receive the brethren. No wonder President Brigham Young observed, quote, It is said the priesthood was taken from the church, but it is not so. The church went from the priesthood, end of quote. The concerning expression by Peter, Paul, John, and James over the falling away were not paranoia, but prophetic warnings about apostasia. Second Phonians 2, 3 through 9, the man of sin, the son of perdition. In addition to the falling away that would take place, Paul explained that the man of sin or the son of perdition, Satan, would be revealed prior to the Lord's second coming, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. The word per perdition is derived from the, the Latin perditionin, per perditionium, meaning ruin or destruction, and it is a title given to Lucifer when he was cast out of God's presence during the pre-mortal life. See Doctrine and Covenants 76, 26. All those who rebelled with Satan against God during the premortal existence became sons of perdition when they were cast out of God's presence. Paul also described the man of sin, one who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, 2 Thessalonians 2.4. The Joseph Smith translation makes clear that in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-9, Paul was referring to Satan. Here is the Joseph Smith translation. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and he it is who now worketh. And Christ suffereth him to work, him meaning Satan, until the time is fulfilled that he shall be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and to destroy him with the brightness of of his coming. Yea, the Lord, even Jesus Christ, whose coming is not until after there shall come a falling away by the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Boy, are we living in a time of deception out of signs and lying wonders of Satan. With the restoration of the gospel and modern scripture, an accurate understanding of the adversary has been restored. In 2 Thessalonians 2-7, Paul said that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. In the New Testament, the word mystery refers to those things that were hidden but have been or will be revealed. Paul's promise that the man of sin, meaning Satan, must be revealed before our Lord could return for the millennial era has been abundantly fulfilled. Lucifer's wicked plans, purposes, and works have been revealed or manifested from time to time, from the day of Paul to the present. At a conference of the church held in June 3rd of 1831, the man of sin was revealed, that means Satan, in that some of the brethren, this was during the conference of the church, some of the brethren were overcome by the devil whom the prophet Joseph Smith rebuked and cast out. So they got to see what it looked like for someone to be possessed by Satan, and that is Satan, Joseph Smith points out, and he cast Satan out. And so Satan is starting to be revealed in how he works. Interest, that would have been an interesting conference to be to, wouldn't it? Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.7, the mystery of iniquity doth already work, meaning it was not the second coming that was imminent, but the great apostasy. In fact, it was already underway by the time of Paul's ministry. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.8, the evil one and all things evil will be destroyed at the Lord's appearance by the brightness of his coming. The Lord and celestial being with him will destroy all terrestrial, all things, let me start again. 
the Lord and celestial beings with him will destroy all things telestial by their glory. Doctrine and Covenants 5.19 2 Thessalonians 2, 10-12 Love of Truth In connection with his teachings about the deceptions of Satan, Paul taught that those who refuse to accept truth will eventually lose the opportunity to receive it. Concerning those who receive not the love of truth, that they might be saved, Paul said that God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. This means that God will permit unbelievers to accept false doctrines and thereby forfeit their salvation. Brothers and sisters, God honors our agency. If you want to believe false doctrines, you are more than welcome. God will allow it. He honors your agency and you will forfeit, forfeit your exaltation. 2 Thessalonians 3, pray for the triumph of the gospel cause. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, pray for us. How often Paul prays for the saints and implores them to unite their prayers for him and the cause. Prayer has a sanctifying effect. It unifies the church. It causes the blessings of heaven to be poured out upon the heads of the saints. We should pray for the success and triumph of all the programs of the Lord's earthly kingdom. And we should then suit our actions to our words. 2 Thessalonians 3, 2, the phrase, All men have not faith, mean, indeed, few men do. And without faith, it is impossible to be saved. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, the phrase, but the Lord is fulfilled, Paul is meaning, this is why we can put our full faith and confidence in the Savior. Unlike verse 2, where few men have faith, the Savior will never fail us. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, if you have not charity, ye are nothing, for charity never faileth. Wherefore, cleave unto charity, and charity is just another name for Christ, because all of those attributes of charity are the attributes of Christ, which is the greatest of all, for all things must fail. But charity is the pure love of Christ, and it endureth forever. And whosoever is found possessed of it at the last day, it shall be well with him. Moroni 7, 46-47. Second Thessalonians 3, 4-5. Paul and his brethren had confidence in the saints in Thessalonica, Though Paul was about to rebuke the idol and is here reminding them of God's love, there should be no hard feelings among, among those who owe, who owe everything to the love of God. Second Thessalonians 3, six From every brother that walketh disorderly. Paul taught that a church member who walketh disorderly, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 and 11, was not to enjoy full association with the church. Paul was specifically speaking about people who refused to work and support themselves. See 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 12. In our day, church members are encouraged not to associate with disorderly people who oppose the truth. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, It is one thing to extend the hand of prospective fellowship to those who seek the truth and who are living according to the best light and knowledge they have. But it is quite another to clasp an enemy to the bosom of the church. Public meetings which are held before the world are open to anyone. Non-members who are earnestly seeking the kingdom are welcome in sacrament meetings. However, those who have known the truth and who have rebelled and become enemies of the church are in a different category. Those who sin and remain unrepentant are cast out of the church. Excommunicated and disfellowship persons have definite restrictions placed upon them. Even God cast one-third of the host of heaven out for rebellion. Enemies from within, traitors to the cause, cultists who prevent the doctrine and practices which lead to salvation, often draw others away with them, and added souls lose their per and and added souls lose their anticipated inheritance in the heavenly kingdom. When cultists and enemies become fixed in their opposition to the church, and when they seek to convert others to their 
divisive position, the course of wisdom is to avoid them, as Paul here directs, and to leave them in the Lord's hands. 2 Thessalonians 3, 7-9 Even Paul and his ministerial associates, who were in fact entitled to temporal help from the saints, chose to set an example of self-support. There are perils in a paid ministry. Of the elders of the church in general, the Lord says, Let the residue of the elders watch over the church and declare the world in the regions round about, and let them labor with their own hands, that there be no idolatry or wickedness practiced. Doctrine and Covenants 52.39 Second Thessalonians 3.10-12 Work is a commandment of the Lord. Thou shalt not be idle. For he that is idle shall not eat the bread, nor wear the garment of the laborer. Doctrine and Covenants 42.42 2 Thessalonians 3.11-15 Temporal work is essential to salvation. Men cannot be saved in idleness. It is not enough simply to believe the great spiritual realities. We could do that as spirits in pre-existence. But we are now placed on a temporal earth to gain the experiences of mortality with the command, In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou shalt return unto the ground. Genesis 3.19 Work as such is an essential part of our eternal progression. Hence, the idler should be had in remembrance before the Lord. Doctrine and Covenants 68.30 And the idler shall not have place in their search, except he repent and mend his ways. Doctrine and Covenants 75.29 Second Thessalonians 3.13 The saints are expected to try and better their circumstances in temporal and spiritual matters, in social and governmental affairs, and in all things. In Initiating and choosing and advocating proper causes is essential to salvation. It is not meet that I should command in all things, the Lord says, for he that is compelled in all things, the same as a slothful and not a wise servant. Wherefore he receiveth no reward. Verily I say, men should be anxiously engaged in a good cause and do many things of their own free will, and bring to pass much righteousness. For the power is in them, wherein they are agents unto themselves. And inasmuch as men do good, they shall in no wise lose their reward. But he that doeth not anything until he is commanded, that, and receive a commandment with doubtful heart, and keepeth, with, with, keepeth it with slothfulness, the same is damned. That's Doctrine and Covenants 58, 26-29. Second Thessalonians 3, verse 14, Paul realizes that some may not heed his letter, have no company with or associate with. The Greek for this phrase is unusually double compound, meaning mixed up together with. It indicates a disassociation that will bring back the person back to a right attitude. The phrase, he may be ashamed, meaning that he might repent. The aim is not punishment, but restoration to fellowship. Second Thessalonians 3.15 Discipline in the church should be brotherly, never harsh. Bishop Robert D. Hells admonished, For you and me as members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are responsible our responsibilities are clear. We are to reach out in love and be anxious to forgive those who have wronged us, help by fellowshipping and caring for those who want to come back, receiving them with open arms and willing hands. We must do as Jude, the brother of James, admonished, having compassion, making a difference. Jude 122. Now I'd just like to read something from two uh, biblical scholars of BYU, Ogden and Skinner about apostasy in the Meridian Dispensation that they wrote. D. Kelly Ogden and Andrew C. Skinner wrote some significant insights on the great apostasy. They stated, the New Testament teaches unequivocally that there was an apostasy from, one and, from the one and only true church established by the Lord in the Meridian of Time. 
Paul and his associates in the Quorum of the Twelve were primarily witnesses of the predicted tragedy. As Paul said goodbye for the last time to some of the church members at Ephesus that he had grown to love, he gave a chilling prophecy about the coming apostasy. For I know there that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away, away disciples after them. This may be the most succinct description in all scripture of the nature of the apostasy. It is neither passive nor gradual. It is a wrenching conflict, and rebellion is at its heart. Some misunderstanding may derive from the language of 2 Thessalonians 2.3, in which Paul tries to uh, allay the fears of the saints who believe erroneously that the second coming of Christ is imminent. He says that the second coming shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. The phrase falling away may connote some people a gradual slide from the truth, but a comparison of the wording of the King James Version with other versions in the Bible, Bible showed the significance of Paul's intent. The New International Version renders the Greek as the rebellion. The Revised Standard Version, the rebellion. The Phillips Bible, a definite rejection of God. The Jerusalem Bible, the great revolt. The Contemporary English Version, people will rebel against God. The original Greek text of 2 Thessalonians 2.3 uses the word apostasia, meaning literally a revolt or breaking away. Apostasy is a conscious act of rebellion against God, in which one deliberately attempts to change divinely appointed doctrine and practices and opposes chosen leaders. Apostasy, by definition, is not a gradual drift from divine truth nor is it waning interest in the gospel. Apostasy, as Paul says, is rebellion, and is always reveals the greater motivator of rebellion, Satan or perdition. As is so clearly meant, demonstrated in Mo Moses chapter 4, verses 1-4, the detailed account of Satan's rebellion, apostasy occurs from within the covenant community and is the result of pride, Lucifer was, after all, a member of the premortal covenant community, an angel in authority in the presence of God, as Doctrine and Covenant 76, 25-26 teaches us. A comparison of Moses 4, 1-4, and Joseph Smith's translation of 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-9, seems to indicate that Paul knew very well the story of Satan's threat. I'm not treat rebellion, that's probably threat of rebellion. Paul's associate in the Quorum of the Twelve, John the Beloved, certainly knew that apostasy occurred within the covenant community. For the witness, for he witnessed the fulfillment of Paul's apostasy. He said they, Antichrist, went out from us, but they were not of us. Other historical writings besides the scriptures testify of the apostasy. From a post-New Testament document called The Teachings of the Twelve Apostles, we see that self-seeking and fraudulent claims of divine guidance were soon preying on the churches. The same picture emerges from the writings of a late first century bishop of Rome named Clement. He was identified by Eusebius of Caesarea, the 4th century father of church history, as that same Clement praised by Paul for being among those whose names are in the book of life. That's in Philippians 4.3. Clement wrote to correct the abominable and unholy schism in the Corinthian branch of the church, a situation that had resulted from apostates opposing church officers, bishops and deacons, who had been lawfully and authoritatively appointed by the apostles. Clement stated emphatically that it was the apostles who had overseen the church and appointed converts to be deacons and bishops. Therefore, the rebellion against legitimate priesthood leadership was the height of religious sedition. But worse than that, says Clements, is that the schism was led many 
has led many astray. It has made many despair. It has made many doubt, and it has distressed us all. Yet it goes on. Here, three important truths are collaborated. Apostasy involves rejection of apostles and their teachings. Mass apostasy destroys the faith of many, and it is hard to curtail. The foundation of the Lord's true church consists of apostles and prophets, as Paul taught. Only the apostles hold the keys of the kingdom. The power to direct priesthood authority is to oversee priesthood ordinances. President Brigham Young said, quote, The keys of the eternal priesthood, which is after the order of the Son of God, are comprehended by being an apostle. All the priesthood, all the keys, all the gifts, all the endowments, and everything preparatory to entering into the presence of the Father and Son are in, composed of, circumscribed by, or I might say incorporated within the circumference of the apostleship. End of President Young's quote. One by one, the apostles chosen by Christ were killed, as he had predicted, and with them went the keys of the kingdom. Institutional re revelation for the direction of the church ceased with the last of the apostles. By the end of the first century after Christ, the apostasy described by Paul was virtually complete. After, then after centuries of silence and confusion about religion and humankind, God spoke his will again clearly and definitively in 1820. As a result, the true church of Jesus Christ was established on earth. The apostolic office and authority were restored to the prophet Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery by the ancient apostles Peter, James, and John. And a new quorum of the twelve apostles was established and began to exercise the keys of the priesthood. As Joseph Smith said, the fundamental principles, government, and doctrines of the church are vested in the keys of the kingdom, and only the apostles hold the keys of the kingdom, and the president of the church holding them all. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for watching. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Hit the like button if you did, and consider subscribing to the channel.